Oh. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. My name is Daniel, and I'm the co-founder and CTO at Dubsmash. Um, at Dubsmash, uh, we say it with video, and we are building uh, one of the largest mobile video communication communication platforms that allows users. to connect and communicate through video. Uh, video is by far the richest medium to express yourself, and it is usually very difficult to create video on mobile. But as of today, uh, Dubsmash enabled more than 100 million users worldwide in over 192 countries to become creators. We started the company uh, roughly one and a half years ago and are building it here out of Berlin. Loving our product and using it every day, uh, we see uh, that users generate over 35 videos every second and sharing them in our app. So the easiest way to create a video on Dubsmash is by selecting uh, an existing sound bite out of our over 70 million sounds large library. These sounds uh, are usually between one and 10 seconds long, but they uh, are movie quotes or music parts or, you know, any kind of audio you can imagine from sports commentary to politician speeches, all kind of audio that is popular, pop culture, and well-known. After selecting the sound bite, then the user usually uh, records himself, filming himself while lip-syncing to that sound. So the final video then can be shared uh, with friends and family, and is usually very, very entertaining. What started uh, as a pure creational tool became now a full-fledged communication platform. Uh, since a few weeks ago, with the launch of our Dustmatch 2.0 version, uh, you can find your friends on our platform itself. Uh, we still have all the tools available for you to create expressive videos within seconds, and you can finally communicate with your peers within the app. We have a feature called DubTalk, which allows people to have human video communication going back and forth inside the app. So uh, to inform our users, for example, about received dubs or if someone reacted, meaning giving feedback to the user that just created the video, we are leveraging push notifications. This is really important, especially for uh, you know, a communication platform that this is happening to inform the users that there is something new on the platform. And uh, we have a couple of use cases more uh, that I'm going to explain in a few seconds. Uh, but one of our core infrastructural parts here is AWS Lambda. So let's have a look at the different use cases that we have uh, here at, uh, at Dubsmash. So as I already mentioned, this is like the first picture um, that Jonas just sent you a new dub. So if I'm getting a new dub within dub talk by a friend of mine, we trigger a push notification to the recipient to inform him uh, that he should come back and check out the new dub he just received. Besides that, we are also running different campaigns where we are addressing larger user segments to re-engage them uh, within our app. So currently, there's the European Championship going, and of course, you will definitely find the right sound bites in our app for your pre preferred team. So what we are doing uh, sometimes is that we send out these push notifications to inform the users that they can find their favorite team quotes or uh, you know, cheering sounds for, for their team, meaning that in a very short time frame, we are addressing millions and millions of recipients. The third use case uh, is so-called silent push. A silent push notification is when we tell the app that is running on our user uh, phone smartphone, uh, we're telling the, the app to, to start in the background and refresh data, pulling data from our service. We are doing this on the one hand side to uh, ping whether these devices are still active, but also uh, that they have data ready when the user starts the app. You can usually see that if there is a small a batch, as it is called uh, uh, on iOS, on the app icon, showing that right now here in this third picture, there are eight unread uh, notifications in the app. So what are the big challenges 
when you consider uh, over 100 million users uh, user base in 192 countries. Yes, of course, it is that global user base which is challenging. We are talking about different time zones that we want to send push notifications to. So you as someone who lives maybe in the United States really don't want to get a push notification about a football match that is happening in Europe while you're sleeping. So addressing the right users at the right time and best of all in real time uh, is kind of challenging, especially if we're talking about sending uh, millions and millions of push notifications. The real-time aspect is really, really important uh, for a communication platform. If you receive a DAP and you don't get immediately informed about it, then there's no point of having a conversation. It's like writing letters where you have to wait days until you get the information. It has to be in real time. It has to be fast. And of course, to measure effectiveness of uh, campaigns, but also finding out uh, uh, glitches within our pipeline, tracking is essential for us. At Dubsmatch, we are entirely data-driven, so that means we measure everything from app usage and how users behave in the app all the way down to even push notification tracking. This is sometimes really challenging uh, because uh, especially Apple is very restricted on what information they provide in order to uh, allow you tracking. So one of you could may ask, hey guys, there are so many solutions out there uh, why are you not taking one of them? And yes, we, we evaluated quite a lot of third-party providers who uh, offer push notification services. And in the very beginning, we, for example, have been working together with uh, Parse Push, uh, which got acquired by Facebook. But uh, we very early identified that with, with our scale, it's just not feasible. And these providers either get tremendously expensive or they're not capable of handling the, the load that we provide. So we came up to the point where we said, okay, we have to build our own solution. And as a AWS customer since the very beginning, obviously we took a look at the tool chain, uh, the tools and the processes they uh, provide. So let me give you like a little insight in how our push notification pipeline here at Dubsmash works. But before doing that, um, let me talk, quickly walk you through the three steps that are important for push. First of all, in order to send a push notification to a device, that device has to register with us that the user give, uh, gave us the permission to even send some push notification and that we have like an endpoint that we can actually address to. The second part will be uh, consisting out of how sending, in, sending push notification is generally being handled. And the third one, is uh, basically talking about result processing, meaning how can we measure whether a push was successfully delivered or not. Okay, let's start with the device registration. Dubsmash runs on both iOS and Android. Um, usually you have to ask the user for the permission in order to send and push notification. On iOS, it works in a way that we have to prompt the user in a message, a model, and the user has explicitly has to click the button to say, yes, I want to receive push notification. On Android, it's a little bit easier, uh, at least for the uh, majority of uh, um, operation system versions, where the user has to acknowledge that we are about to send him push notifications uh, before he installs the app. This might be changing uh, in the very latest Android version, but for now the majority of users is basically accepting that um, or before installation. So what happens is that when the device is getting started for the very first time after installation, uh, our app calls the AWS service SNS, Simple Notification Service. SNS is basically a, a wrapper for both APNS and GCM, Google Cloud Messaging and Apple Notification Service, obviously, is providers who then deal with sending the messages to the actual target. So at SNS, we have a, a very simple interface where we can register with the device, and SNS takes care about everything else, dealing with Apple as well as Google. Uh, they also support a couple of other providers, but they are not relevant to us, and basically maintain uh, this, this, this pipeline. So what we get back from SNS is a push token. 
And this push token is something that uh, we can use to address that single device. It's a so-called ARN. And uh, what our clients then do is they send this ARN and some device data to an AWS service called S2S, the procuring system, and in there it relies until one of our workers pull out the data and persist it into our device store. As a device store, uh, for historical reasons, we are uh, using Postgres. And in there, we have like a, one huge massive table uh, that is partitioned to deal with easier scanning and, and scaling. But what's interesting maybe for you is to give you like a little extract on how such a device registration uh, looks like. I just printed here uh, the, the JSON that our clients are sending to F2S, and it uh, contains that data field, which tell us, okay, that user who just registered is an Android device with a specific build number slash app version. Uh, we also transmit the last location that the user has been to, um, a geolocation basically that helps us to uh, target devices much better. We also get an active cultural selection, uh, as it is called here, which tells us, okay, this user is speaking a certain language in a certain country. Of course, we also get other information like the time zone uh, the user is right now, its username, installation ID. Uh, installation ID is a unique identifier for us to identify a certain installation for a user. So for example, uh, a user could own two devices, uh, an iPad and an iPhone, but both would have two different installation IDs. Um, yeah, we also have the token. That's the token that we that F and S is actually getting back from Google as well as uh, Apple. So we could theoretically push directly uh, to these providers without F and S. Uh, we store it just for security reasons and an ARN, which obviously is our single token to address that device. So once that data is persisted in our Postgres database, we can go to step number two: sending out push notifications. And here we have multiple triggers. So one trigger could be, for example, that I received a dub from someone. That could be a trigger. Or a trigger could be that we're saying, okay, we want to uh, address on Sunday uh, at 6 p.m. here in Germany all German users, or let's say 5.30, uh, because I should do a dub before the match starts to engage them with our app. So that push trigger basically calls our notification scheduler. And that scheduler's job is to load the device information, especially the ARNs for our targeted devices. So if you are talking about and pushing to an entire time zone like Europe Berlin on Sunday, it will filter through our device data store for all the devices which match that time zone. Um, usually that data is quite a lot if we are talking about large campaigns. And uh, in order to massively paralyze that, because we want to send them out as fast as possible, uh, our notification scheduler slices the result set from the database tree into batches of about 35,000 ARNs. They are getting transferred to our notification dispatcher, which can take that data in parallel and wrap it into the payload of SNS, meaning it's slicing it further so that out of 35,000 ARNs, we call SNS with about 300 recipients plus the actual text message, like the information that is being displayed uh, on the phone and some tracking information. And then that's basically all we do on our side. Since uh, SNS is super scalable, we can hit it pretty hard uh, in, in parallel. And what SNS then is doing, it's invoking uh, Lambda. Because Lambda is for us doing the actual sending out of the push notification. Because we parallelize on SNS, SNS starts Lambda parallelize, and Lambda then takes these 300 recipients, loop over it, and call SNS again to send out the actual push notification. So first we use SNS as a trigger, and then SNS actually send out to the different devices. To give you a, like a little code overview, on how that looks like, I hope. 
me switch to the next slide now. Yes, I can. Uh, I gave a little code example here on how that function actually looks like that is sending out the push uh, notification with Lambda. So that uh, function is being invoked from Lambda, and uh, what we do is we basically take the payload of the 300 recipients and within a for loop, loop over it. And for every recipient that we have, well, we first of all check whether that recipient actually has an ARN. If not, we just skip that one. But then we are trying to get the endpoint from SNS, check whether that endpoint is still active. What could happen, for example, if a user uninstalls the app or removes the permission for us to send out push notification, um, that endpoint is being disabled at SNS. So there's no need for us to call uh, send out a push notification to a device that is disabled. And since this um, disabling is a very asynchronous, so uh, it's, it's hard for us to track it on our side, so we are always double checking with uh, AWS SNS whether that endpoint can be reached. Um, I already mentioned different reasons why endpoints could be uh, disabled. Uh, Google is very nice with that. They usually give you, or they give you like a synchronous callback if a device did, uh, was not able to be reached, or if a user uninstalled the app, um, pushing it, it will result in a in an error message. Uh, whereas Apple is dealing with it asynchronously, meaning if I'm pushing to an Apple device that is not active anymore, I'm not getting a callback, but I'd rather get informed by a service called uh, feedback service that is provided by APNS. Uh, and that feedback service usually should uh, tell us within 24 hours that the service is not available. Um, that's not very reliable. Good thing is SNS is handling all of that, so we just have to ask SNS, is it still active or not? So when that endpoint is active, then we just basically take the message uh, that is in our event payload as well and call endpoint.publish, handing over the message uh, as a JSON and still yeah, tell that the endpoint is, is still active for our result set. And in our result JSON that we in the end return uh, out of that function, I'll come to that in a second, uh, we can basically make sure, okay, Lambda execution uh, was successful. Yeah, so let's look into the result processing. Um, I just took the uh, Lambda part and the SNS push part from, from this slide. Uh, I can't uh, animate it here. Yeah. So it's basically, in the moment when Lambda is pushing to SNS, we we gather the information, we get it directly from Google if something is not working out, but we are also getting the Lambda result, uh, whether that function has been executed successfully, and throw all that data into an SQS queue. Um, we do that for the reason because we want to get that information if a device has been disabled to uh, remove it from our database as well. So we have a couple of workers running behind that SQS queue that basically just pull pull the information, process it, and update uh, devices in our device data store. So for the next query set that is looking for Berlin, Europe, time zone, for example, um, devices that are not active anymore, that where SNS reported to us that they have been disabled, we want to not include them in order to reduce the call of useless uh, SNS uh, invocations. Um, that happens asynchronously, so for us it's not really important that it's immediately updated uh, depending on the size of the different uh, push campaigns or batches that we are sending out. It might take a few minutes uh, until the results are back. So to give you like a, a little final overview on a few numbers, um, with, uh, with that pipeline we were able to send over 500 million push notifications uh, in, the, in the last month. Um, meaning that we invoked Lambda over 3.5 million times, and within Lambda we did over 11.8 million seconds of compute time. The good thing here is that we do not have to uh, maintain any server infrastructure behind that. I mean, that's the cool thing about Lambda. It's really just uploading a piece of code that gets invoked via SNS and does all the massive parallelization and heavy lifting for us. So we just provide the input, everything else is being handled by Lambda. 
you might ask, okay, and how do the machine look like that get the data into Lambda? Um, yeah, we have, uh, for, for scheduling, we have a pretty large machine because um, that's an eight core machine with 14 gigs of RAM. Uh, we are running that of one of the uh, of our partners uh, called Heroku. Um, they uh, they basically take care about them. the machines. It's also running on AWS. And uh, the reason why we have a 14 gig machine here is uh, if we want to get large user segments out of it, we have to materialize that information at one point in order to slice it. For the dispatcher itself, it's a two gigabyte, two core machine. Uh, we are running four, usually a three to four machine, depending on how many we are sending out. But the overall setup on our side is five servers for getting the data out of our database and then handing it over to Lambda, we can massively send it out. So to send out to 15 million uh, users, it usually takes less than 10 minutes to do so. From getting it out of the database until the last device uh, has been pushed. Cool. That's basically all from, from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's say it with video. Give the app a try. Uh, yeah, give the app a try. Play around with it. Uh, enjoy uh, having very entertaining conversations using videos. And uh, I think I'm open to question now. And I think there are already the first ones in here. Um, Okay, uh, the question is, why are you using SQS to gather registration and delivery events and not Kinesis streams? Um, yes, this is a very good point. Um, we are using SQS through to historical reasons. We started with that uh, for the registration. I mean, it obviously makes sense that we want to have a buffer somewhere in between to process that information asynchronously. Um, the reason why we are not using Kinesis streams uh, in, in that point is, um, we haven't just built it. <laughs> um, of course, you would need to, to keep track of where in the stream you stopped processing. If something happens, you need to build a synchronization mechanism somehow that is given by FQS. Um, but the, let's say the financial benefits of using Kinesis in here were not worth uh, switching the technology there. I hope that answers your question. Okay, any more questions from your side? Yes. Do you disable devices on the first and single push error, or do you have some kind of error counter in the device database and have thresholds to disable devices? Um, the question of this is that we disable these devices immediately, um, because when either Apple or Google is telling us that the device is not active anymore, it's definitely not active. Um, so we trust and have to rely on their statement whether devices are active. So the moment you get that, uh, it's, it's being disabled. We know and we build the app in a way that even if you reinstall, for, so for every new install, we get a registration, or even if you do an update, we, we update our registration with uh, SNS, and that basically uh, allows us to re-register like new tokens immediately. Uh, why are you complicating the architecture by using lambdas and directly calling SNS yourself for the pushes? Well, the good thing is uh, we don't have to take care about the uh, parallelization. So we just hand over with a single SNS call 300 devices that are being looped over by, with Lambda. If we would need to build up that uh, infrastructure, that would be like a lot of work for us. We would need to maintain these machines. We would need to start them depending on the load uh, because you just want to pay for what you really use for, uh, and, and Lambda is just the easiest way uh, for us to do that. So it's really about keeping uh, infrastructure overhead as small as possible. And it's actually not complicating it. It's, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. Um, what what uh, the Lambda function also does, I haven't shown that in the slides, uh, within the app, we have a notification center, so you can see in the app what is going on, like a little bit on Facebook notification center on the website. If you hit the, the little globe on top, you see what is going on. Uh, Lambda is besides sending that push notification, is also calling one of our services to make the entry of the push notification also persisted in the notification uh, center of that user. So there are a couple of functions that are actually being called by, by Lambda there. 
<laughs> Removing devices is done by EC2 instances. Uh, why not by Lambda? Yes, I totally agree with you, Stefan. Um, that could also be done by, uh, by Lambda itself. Um, also here for uh, focus reasons, uh, we haven't had the, the resources to do that. It's on the roadmap, but right now uh, it's an optimization that's currently not needed in that sense, and we rather focus on building uh, new features for our users. And it's actually not even done by EC2 instances. It's actually done by uh, little workers also run at Heroku. Uh, so for us, it's basically a, uh, a salary worker who's doing that. We're using Python for that. So it's a few lines of code that would need to be touched, but yeah, haven't had the, the resources yet. All right, any more questions? Thank you very much. Uh, you're also <laughs> very welcome. Um, if you have any, you know, further questions or follow-ups, um, I think I put my email address in there, also my Twitter handle. Uh, you can also ping me on Dubsmash itself. My username is Daniel3. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, we have a follow-up question here. Uh, what's the cost of sending this many push messages? Um, well, the pricing of uh, SNS is published on the website, also the pricing for uh, Kinesis ex uh, execution. But uh, I can tell you it's uh, right now, so for, for this setup, it's at a very, very it's, it's barely four digit. So it's, it's really not expensive. Uh, we did the math on using a third party provider with that and that would be already five digits. So for us, it's a, it's a big cost savings. All right, if there are no more questions, uh, as already mentioned, feel free to drop me an email. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you tell some more uh, about tracking? Um, any like specifics that you're interested in with the push notifications or? Okay, so what, what you can do, okay, I can, I can share a little bit insight. Um, the big problem with push notification tracking is that um, when, on Apple at least, uh, push notification is being received, uh, you can only, or the app itself gets only informed if the user opens the app through that notification. So if you swipe it on your home screen or if you open it in your uh, notifications overview, so if you swipe from the top to the bottom. Um, so if you open the app through this one, then it's, something that the app gets told. And this is something where you can react on and basically trigger a tracking event, uh, meaning push or app open through push notification. If the user goes into the app, like say 10 minutes after the push has been received, but without opening it through the app, there's no chance for you to track it. Um, it's, it's a little bit, uh, you, have to, you have to do other analytics like time boxing where you say, okay, how is the activity uh, in our app, or how has the activity in our app increased after sending out a push campaign? So you need to do other, other kind of tracking. Um, you can also, uh, for 
for Android, I think that's working as well, that you can even get the information if a, a push got dismissed. And uh, for for silent pushes, of course, the, the app is getting open. This is something that you can, uh, where you can act on and trigger your own tracking events. But usually, uh, there's not much you can do. So for us, it's really about getting the information if a user opened it through the push itself, because that could mean that it's really relevant for him, and also looking at activity after uh, after basically a time window after the push had been sent out to the user. Unfortunately, both Apple and Google do not provide the, the proper tools for it, uh, because you don't know the intention, and even Apple doesn't know the intention of the user of opening your app whether it was due to the push notification or due to the badge that is on your app icon, or he just was in the mood opening it and uh, want, wanted to send it up. So that's something where you are kind of limited in, in terms of tracking. No, we are not using uh, CloudWatch uh, for activity tracking. That was the question. Um, we built our own uh, analytics pipeline uh, where we aggregate, uh, where we trigger client events within our clients, batch them, and then sending these client events to AWS Kinesis. And behind Kinesis, there is a, a fleet of different workers who process the data, who clean it, who uh, look for duplicates and then persisted in uh, either BigQuery or AWS S3, where other tools are hooking up to it, where we can do analysis on it. We are also currently looking into leveraging Kafka for real-time analytics to see and to segment certain users so we can basically trigger push notifications if you haven't done a dub within the last three days. So based, all our tracking is basically done within the client, about 95%, uh, but that's all built without CloudWatch. You're welcome. Any more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, I um, just want to say thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope that presentation was a little bit inspirational and uh, gave you a good insight on how we uh, built that and how we run that. Uh, I can tell that it hasn't caused us any trouble, like not any major trouble. <laughs> Usually it's our code that uh, wasn't performing that well, but now we, we built that uh, actually over a few weeks and uh, run that for almost uh, nine, ten months now. Um, it's scalable, so it's, it's scaling with our user base as, the, as, as it uh, continues to grow. And 
Of course, I know that there are a few points where we could leverage Lambda even more. Uh, I'd like to do that, but uh, as it is for a startup, resources and time is limited, so for us it's focus. Um, yeah, as already mentioned, if you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to send me an email at daniel.com, and uh, I wish you a pleasant day. Thank you very much.